Okay, hello everyone and welcome to this month's Practice Hub Facebook Live event. Thanks very much for joining us today. Um, my name is Anna Maria Gibb and I'm the Senior Product Manager here at Practice Hub. And a big part of my role involves uh, ensuring that our Practice Hub policy and procedures uh, that we provide to our clients reflect the ever-changing needs of healthcare practices. So it's an important role for to keep our uh, practices current with their information. <clears throat> Excuse me. So today's policy is relates to the use of CCTV, and that policy should balance the improvements in safety and security for the staff and patients with the need to respect the privacy and confidentiality of medical consultations as well. So before we get to the nitty gritty about the policy itself, let's do my usual overview of the importance of things to think about when you're creating a policy and procedure. So some general guidelines here. And first of all, I think it's worth bearing in mind that they always need to be meaningful. They need to be easy to understand and easy to follow. So those would be the three key things that I would be bearing in mind when creating a policy and procedure. So when we start thinking about developing a policy, it's important to think about why it's required. Why are we doing this? Um, and why is it important? So these are two key things to think about. Now, I tend to think there are about four key reasons that you create a policy. Uh, the first one relates to compliance with legislation, regulations, standards and guidelines. So a good example of that would be your privacy policy. There, are leg there is legislation, there are standards, uh, all relating to, to privacy. So that's one reason. The second reason is patient safety. So ensuring things like infection control policies are in place to ensure the safety of your patients and also your practice team. Third reason is risk minimization. So if you can reduce risks in your practice, making it safer for you, all the better. And the risks that you need to think about would relate to business risks. So financial risks, reputational risks, operational risks, um, those sorts of things. Safety risks, so work health and safety, previously mentioned infection control, um, and clinical risks. So areas around, you know, maybe medication management, um, recalls, reminders, those sorts of things. And the final one is around operational risk. So times where you, uh, there are many ways you could perform a certain function or process or procedure, but you've determined what's the best way to do it from your, um, for your practice, for your organisation. So operational excellence, so you have that consistency that everyone is doing the procedures in the way that is of the highest quality. So when it comes to procedures, this is around the, uh, the who does it, how it gets done, when it gets done, how often, those sorts of things. So ensure all your must-haves are covered under the procedures and ensure that they are steps. And this can make the procedures a really good training tool for your practice team, especially for new team members when they're doing things for the first time. It can give them a really good kind of background, a good explanation, the policy why we do it and the procedure, the who, how and when it gets done. Uh, the other thing that's really useful to do is many of these policies, most of your policies, they don't kind of live in a vacuum. There's that kind of connectivity between other um, policies and procedures in your practice as well. So, for example, in today's policy about CCTV, we'll also be thinking about privacy, around code of conduct and those sorts of things. So within your policy and procedure, always think about what other policies may be impacted or have a connection and make sure you incorporate that as well. And the third thing that's worth thinking about after your policy and your procedures are references and resources. So to kind of bring these policies to life, 
articles, if you can find articles and case studies with examples of how, um, how things are done, how procedures are implemented, how the legislation is applied, it's really useful to provide those links for the people reading the policy and procedure to give them a kind of whole or, you know, a more holistic view of the policy itself. All right, so let's have a look at today's policy. Um, so it is, um, as you can see on my screen, the use of closed circuit TV in practice. And this is the template that uh, Practice Hub provides to its clients. Um, and I think it's really important. I'm particularly passionate about this policy because I'm cons my concern is if you're not fully aware of the requirements um, and there is a lot of legislation involved that you could find yourself in a little bit of trouble and potentially have some risk that we've been trying to mitigate through the policy. So legislation is critical. And at the outset, I would um, highlight to all of you today that different states have different legislation. So depending on where you're located, really, really important to be familiar with the legislation that applies in your state. All right, so um, looking at our policy here, we've got um, the objectives. So what are the objectives of our policy? So it's to deter security incidents such as theft, vandalism and violence. Um, and I can see we've got a question there. Can it be used to deter forms of aggressive or violent behaviour? I guess it's possible in terms of uh, if people know that they could be caught on camera, it might deter that behaviour, but it could be part of a whole uh, suite of processes or things that you do in your practice. So maybe there's signage about unacceptable behaviour, as well as just having the CCTV. So it is definitely something that might deter people. Um, it may be to gather information to be used as evidence if a crime is committed. Um, where the camera is recording um, and it can be used to allow security incidents to be viewed and then a response to be taken as well. So those are the objectives and I think for most practices that I speak to it's really about increasing security and safety for the patients and the practice team. All right, so let's move on to our key requirements. And there are four re key requirements, I think, that you need to think about with a um, CCTV policy. And the first one, and I think most people are really familiar with this, is notifying that you're using CCTV to your patients and staff. Um, and so that is one of the key requirements. Then there is the monitoring of the surveillance and then the installation, secure storage, retention, destruction, and de-identification of the footage. And finally, the use and disclosure of those recordings that you have. So let's have a look through each of these four items. All right. So one of the things that's quite important here is that employees are notified that the cameras are used. So you need to advise new starters um, that you have that. It includes the kind of surveillance, how it'll be carried out, et cetera. And we've got a comment in here that in the ACT, workers who will regularly and ordinarily be subject to surveillance must be notified. So important as I keep, I really will continue to um, reiterate in this presentation that you really need to make sure that you're complying with legislation relevant to your state. So ensuring that people are aware um, and that the cameras should be clearly visible as well. Um, the other comment that we have in our policy is they need to be visible at the entrance to each area under surveillance. And I suppose the thinking is, you know, if you don't have it at the entry, by the time I've come into your practice and I'm well into it and then I see that there's CCTV surveillance, I may in some circumstances, had I known that at the entry, I may not have come in. So possibly extreme scenario, but best to be covered, make sure that the information is clearly visible at the entrance where the, camp, where the surveillance is taking place. Um, also probably important depending to, to know your patient demographics. Um, so if you've got patients with disabilities, language or literacy issues, that you're, the way in which you communicate that you're using CCTV is clear to those people as well. 
All right, so moving along to the second one. So there's a couple of options when it comes to monitoring. Um, and I suspect most of you that do have CCTV or planning to put it in would go with the non-continuous monitoring. So essentially someone is not sitting there all day, day in, day out watching the footage. It's more that it's recording and if you need to, you'll go back um, and review the sections as required. So in that case, if you're going to do continuous monitoring, make sure people are appropriately trained um, as required by the security industry legislation. So again, another piece of legislation that you need to be aware of. So the third item is around installation, secure storage, uh, retention, destruction and de-identification of the footage. First and foremost, installation of CCTV needs to meet legislative requirements. And in most, if not all states and territories, that needs to be done by a licensed security equipment installer. Now, I believe many electricians also have that additional license, but make sure you do check. And I guess the other side of that is probably don't install it yourself. Um, ensure that it's installed by a licensed uh, installer. So very important that you're aware of that too. The next thing you need to think about um, is who is authorised to view the footage. Um, and so you'll need to think about what are your standard operating procedures, who are the authorised employees, who are the authorised um, contractors, um, and, and make that call. Um, you need to obviously, like any other um, private and confidential information, make sure that the material is protected um, against unauthorised access, alteration, dissemination, disclosure, loss or destruction. So if you think about dissemination, what you don't need is um, any of your footage suddenly turning up on Facebook or YouTube. So just ensuring that it is very securely managed as well. Make sure it's maintained so that it's working effectively. Um, keep relevant record keeping, keeping procedures um, and it needs to be kept for only as long as necessary. So again, something to think through how long is as necessary and maybe get some advice um, to, in terms of your individual circumstances. All right, and of course, I think um, the most challenging part. Now I can see we have a question. And it says, does the policy cover who is authorised to access records made by surveillance within the practice? That is something that our policy suggests that it's people like the practice principal and the practice manager. But as you'll see with this last component here around use and disclosure, I think this is an instance where it's very, very important um, to get good professional advice because this, I think, is where you can get a little bit unstuck. So down there, there on our policy, there are some circumstances um, under which you can provide the information. But here's a little bit of food for thought. So a couple of scenarios I've thought of um, and see if maybe they ring a bell for you. Um, the practice has CCTV outside in the practice car park. A patient claims that another patient has damaged their car, maybe they've backed into them or something or opened their door and scratched their car, and they want to access the CCTV. So what happens next? So maybe in this instance, the practice manager goes and reviews the footage, comes back to the patient, says, no, it didn't happen. Patient's not satisfied, wants to see it for themselves. What happens next? So there's one scenario that you might have to have a think about. Um, similarly, a patient in the practice claims somebody stole their purse out of their handbag uh, while they were waiting in reception. They want to see the CCTV footage to see who it was and if that's what happened, what happens next. And then another one is a staff member maybe making a claim of bullying against another staff member and they think that footage might prove that that staff member is maybe making rude gestures behind their back, that sort of thing. Again, they want to see the CCTV to um, confirm their suspicions and, and I guess bolster their claim. So how would you handle these things? So if you have your procedures around the fact that who is authorised to view the footage, and importantly, what does the legislation suggest? And as we mentioned at the very beginning, it's so important that you balance what that patient needs or what you can provide versus maintaining the privacy and confidentiality of 
everyone in the practice because let's think about it some of that footage may show other patients as well so having a, a patient come and view footage where they can see others might not be ideal so um, my top tip on that one is call your MDO um, because I think this is an area, as I said, you can kind of manage secure storage, proper installation, all of those sorts of things. But when it comes to that use and disclosure, who gets to see the footage, depending on the circumstances, get professional advice um, for that as well. So we have a question there. Uh, do I need to specify where the CCTVs are located in the practice in the policy? Um, in our policy that we have in our template, we basically say the cameras should be visible. Um, and also, if you put your signage at the entrance where the cameras are going to be, that should cover that as well. But again, your licensed installer who is um, fully qualified and understands the requirements in each of your states will be able to give you good guidance on that as well. All right, so just to wrap up, thinking about, um, you know, have a look at uh, thinking about your policy if you're thinking about putting in CCTV, or if you already have it, have a think about are you covering all of these key requirements um, and do you have a policy and procedure? Are staff appropriately trained and aware as well? Um, so just to wrap up, um, let me see. It's really important to comply. Make sure you're familiar with your state legislation. Um, contact your MDO. Um, Practice Hub, you're looking at one of our templates. We have templates for basically most aspects of practice operations and to meet accreditation standards. And I always think it's better to use policies and procedures developed by experts and just have to edit them rather than have to write them yourself from scratch. So have a think about that. Um, the recording of this presentation will be on our website shortly. Please feel free to share it with others. Um, we have a special offer at the moment, uh, 15 months for the price of 12 for our new clients. So please have a look on our website and I'll be leave, there'll be a link in here. Um, and one, uh, one final thought, and I think my colleague will pop a link in, is that uh, when you do have your policies, make sure you get your staff to sign off on them. So really simple process. Uh, I've read and understood and agree to comply is a really simple electronic way of doing that. And we'll send you a link to, or share a link to a case study where just being able to prove that got a practice out of potentially a tricky situation. Um, Join us next week uh, for our Foundations of Successful Practice Management, where we're presenting on the strategic role of an effective practice manager. So we have some great speakers, including Gary Smith, um, who will be talking about, I guess, moving from that kind of operational to more strategic functions as a practice manager. If you're already a Practice Hub client, don't forget you can contact our support team anytime to make sure you're using your Practice Hub platform to its most um, effectiveness. And on that note, um, thank you for joining us. Look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.